Michael Lentz Weekly Daily Wednesday, where we sit back, relax, Hi. take that midweek break, talk about the things that we found going on in the world of Linux. I'm Vin, that's Joe, that's Pedro, and Bio Powers Combined. Dubstep music at the intro. Don't you love that? I do, man. It's awesome. So, what's new with everyone, Pedro? Before we went live, uh, you, you were uh, showing everybody that like fancy hot video game. Yes, it's... Um, what are those so uh, old fake Tetris machines? It's the magic brick game. And it's, yeah, it's got, they claim the box anyway says that it's mm -hmm. got like six games in one. Yeah, six in one. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you ever think it's about that mostly, when you see, uh, like, have you seen the picture of like, it's not the Sony PlayStation, it's the phony PlayStation. I've always wanted to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the poly station. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that. But yeah, it's mostly like Tetris and Tetris-like games, falling blocks, uh, including that fake Tetris one with like the um, <laughs> the single uh, square pieces and the three um, squares along um, straight lines. It's like, huh. It, it's actually kind of fun. <laughs> I'm easily Those amused. Those are fun. Right? <laughs> oh, I like old school little handhelds. Those are so fun. <laughs> old things. What's up, Joe? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I have actually a lot going on in the world of Linux, but I'll have to let everyone know next week, including a few surprises. So that'll that'll be awesome. It's stuff I'm working on <laughs> and stuff that's happening. <laughs> right on, right Yay. on. Over here, I'm playing around with a, uh, if you watch the show on Saturday, I left the box. I got up to go get the box, left the box. Um, a USB-C, like, 13-inch monitor that we're going to be using to um, bring it on guest. That's finally happening. And uh, stay tuned. Yay. Saturday, that's going to get a run. But, you know, I was curious, man, because I have that USB-C port on the NVIDIA 26. And I was like, can I just plug this under Linux and it works? And it did. So... Good on that. Ended up having to plug an HDMI cable in it at the end of the day, unfortunately, because XFCE's got a problem with some things, and I'm not afraid to admit mm. it. I knew I was probably <laughs> going to run into that issue, but um, good times. Good times. So, Pedro, the best desktop available on Linux is <laughs> getting Arguable. updated. Come on, man. Don't hate. <laughs> Don't hate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's GNOME 334, and uh, new version's already out. Uh, Solus actually got it pretty early, but I still haven't been arsed to actually give it a shot. But the news here is that uh, GNOME 334 is now managed entirely via Systemd. Yes, uh, Dbus still uh, controls some stuff, but that stuff uh, is still being controlled by Systemd proper. So basically, you have... If you've ever wondered what uh, System D that or the System D distribution would be, just pick any distro that runs GNOME three thirty four and have a look for yourself, because that's going to be the future, whether we like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Very awesome. So, um, <laughs> what's what? <laughs> <laughs> so what's cool about this is now that systemd is managing gnome 3.34 hardware components can be sandboxed for greater security which is actually really really awesome and services can now be shut down and restarted depending on what hardware is or isn't present which is actually really nice it helps with memory overhead and whatnot and you know i it was we kind of saw this coming so this this actually makes sense. <laughs> and uh, thanks again to our Theron and chat for submitting this. This was awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's dumb. Mm -hmm. you, you kind of expect yeah. this. So, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's no it's honestly <laughs> it's like well, it, the more yeah i i kind of hope that uh system d will actually make it or not interfere enough i guess is where i'm going with this it's like just let the uh desktop environment do its own thing and see how that goes uh, yeah. We, we need one cohesive stack so when something goes wrong, all of it goes wrong. That'll help attract Windows users. They're like, oh, I'm used to this. <laughs> I am used to the chain reaction of nope. <laughs> <laughs> it is good to see. Yeah, but definitely. On the topic mm -hmm. of Microsoft, 
Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. So, um, <laughs> Linus Torvalds, you may know him as a uh, granddaddy Linux himself. And when posed the questions like, what do you think about uh, Microsoft basically buying their way into Linux? And uh, yeah, people were saying, it's like, yeah, Microsoft is wolf in sheep's clothing and they will wreck Linux. And Torvalds basically said, um, well, as far as we can tell from the kernel side, it's actually a good thing. There's more money coming in. There's more developers coming in. There's more uh, work getting done. Uh, there's a lot of, um, sure, uh, whenever a new company, it's one of the examples that he brings, uh, whenever a new company joins the, uh, the Lytics Foundation, they have their own ideas and their own agendas that they're going to try and push. But in that respect, Microsoft is no different than any of the others that have were already a part of the Linux Foundation. So as far as he and the rest of the kernel team are concerned, it's like, yeah, it's cool. And uh, he also mentioned the uh, the XFAT patent issue. Uh, <laughs> that, that was one of the uh, questions they brought up. It's like, yeah, they, they dropped that patent. Uh, they made the patent available. And supposedly they're not going to be suing anyone else over it oh, and that no. was my last that was like a sad day so, for you man you had to give up one of your little anger gems you're like oh. yeah that, oh, that, that yeah. was like the last gripe so much like linus i'm just going to wait and see well, i'm definitely thinking about mm-hmm. it alone. linus are you getting soft in your old age come on come on man yes. what happened to the nvidia linus that i keep behind me he's my spirit animal 2012 uh, was long ago dude <laughs> It's either that or parts of Microsoft, legitimately, some might even call them the smart parts of Redmond, are legit trying to change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, for everyone out there worried, uh, that is worried about this, um, remember that Linux is protected by the GPL2 open source licensing. So no single company can control it, not even Microsoft. And in fact, Linux is the driving force for most tech companies whose developers have to work on the Linux kernel in a collaborative and transparent way. And now, yes, even Microsoft has to bow down to the Penguin. Our Penguin army is marching forward. And, you know, it's actually quite the reverse. Uh, Microsoft is like 50% Linux now. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're the one taking that, them over. <laughs> We want to take a look at what Torvalds actually said, man. He rolled out what the whole anti-Microsoft thing was sometimes funny as a joke, but not really. Good. I'm glad you threw that in light. It's because you didn't say it funny as a joke. (laughs) Yeah. Um, They're much friendlier. I talk to Microsoft engineers at various conferences and feel like, yes, they have changed and the engineers are happy and they're like, really happy working on Linux. So I completely dismissed all the answers. See, I don't believe that a minute, but (laughs) (laughs) it's going to take a while, man. When you have like two plus decades of a company that genuinely was trying to snuff this out, even though they've rolled over turns like, okay, maybe we're not going to do this anymore. Maybe maybe it's going to be a thing and we're not going to fight it. Because you do have to consider, like, I wouldn't be surprised by 2021 that in its own way, Microsoft will be the largest distributor of Linux with WSL. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you think and about Azure like is pretty big in the cloud, yeah. and that's built on Linux. Let's make it a money, man. And <laughs> at the end of the day, the kernel doesn't care who you work for. As long as yep. the code gets done, yep. it gets fixed. Exactly. So again. Mm-hmm. I hate on that part. And we are still talking about a company that decided there you go. we all had to step back. They're using Chromium for their new browser. Like what? Yes. <laughs> I, I still don't know. I, I am curious to see how that boils out. Mm-hmm. Twitter. Never heard mm-hmm. of it. Tell me about it. <laughs> oh, so so uh, I found this. This is really cool. Cobbird is a new Twitter client for Linux and is a fork of Corebird. Yeah, you know, I had just started using the original Corebird Twitter client when I started doing LWW, and then it ceased to function. So, you know, I was happy when I found the newly developed uh, Cobbird. And um, as other Twitter clients go, it, it, it doesn't have complete functionality uh, because of the way the Twitter API works. But I love um, Cobbird 
But my biggest complaint is that its notification stream is mentions only, not likes, follows, and so on. So that was my biggest complaint. But other than that, other than that, you have to refresh it every few minutes for new to see new tweets, and that's not a big deal to me um, because some other third party. Uh, Twitter apps that I've been using on Android do the same thing. And I'm just, I was really happy when I came across this and I want more development to continue on Cobbert because we need a good Twitter client for Linux, <laughs> very def most definitely. But I worry, of course, because Twitter will change things and, the, and it might break things again. So we'll see. Hopefully the developers will be able to continue to plow on this project and keep those APIs up to date. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's definitely the big thing. one because yeah, covered, like you said, it stopped working because Twitter changed its API. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, this is too much trouble. We're just not going to bother. And uh, now Cobert is uh, doing the same that Corbert did and at least they have the same functionality, or so they claim, the um, that Corbird had. So all of that uh, basic stuff is there. But the goal here is to expand. Mm -hmm. And like Jill yeah. already mentioned, there are a couple of issues that need work, like the automatically refreshing feed, the notifications feed actually showing you all the notifications that have just the mentions. Uh, and at this point, I think the best um, Twitter client on Linux is still TweetDeck. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. there, it's on the browser, it does all the things like, eh, that, that's pretty good. That's good. <laughs> I share those feels, man, because yeah. with TweetDeck, <laughs> one of the things that I like to have it on a dedicated screen with all of my searches and it auto refreshes. Remember when Google yeah. Plus used to do that too, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and it could just Aww. roll by and it required no interaction and I could scroll back. This, I can't say it looks interesting because neither the article or the GitHub page have a screenshot of it. So you might yeah. want to throw that in <laughs> eventually. A uh, dedicated desktop app. I'm just not feeling it on that. And what I gotta say is like Twitter's Russian roulette because you can think of it. I think I went through like three <laughs> unofficial Twitter clients because you know what Twitter they were all better than the one that you had. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the way Twitter did it, you could get an access token up to a certain amount. It used to just be a free for all. It was a wonderful time. Then Twitter's like, we need to control all this. So uh -huh. yeah, I, I, I use the official Twitter client now begrudgingly, but on mobile, but on the desktop, yeah, yeah. tweet deck. It depends your use yep. case. If you're just checking in, checking tweets, man, twitter.com is good enough. I don't know where I'm at with a standalone. There's nothing against it. It's just, I don't know. I, I would never. It would need to be. Yeah, it would have it to would do need something to have, more, like, right? Tweet deck levels of functionality to be useful. That hundred mm -hmm. percent. So, mm -hmm. so <laughs> all right. Are we so, not, uh, more gnomes? Yeah. Jeez, you're just you're gonna have to get a gnome T-shirt, <laughs> a gnome cup. Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> well, this isn't just about gnome. This is more about Solus and uh, their new. Um, development uh and well they kind of needed the new gnome bits to expand the functionality on budgie which was like the big selling point of solus back in the day and budgie it's currently up to version 10.5.1 and it makes use of a lot of the stuff that gnome 334 introduces like the new gtk stuff so and quite a bunch of stuff that uh, joshua strobel has been working on the Big focus, yeah, the, the big focus was just to get GNOME in place and working as well as it could so they could continue working on Budgie, which is why Solos was one of the first distros. As soon as GNOME 334 came out, it's like, boom, there, it's in, mm -hmm. go. And yeah, the, they, they've also been uh, keeping up uh, work in KDE. And of course, Mate is also one of their supported um, desktop environments. So that's kept very regularly up to date as well. But yeah, the, the big one here is all the GTK3 stuff for the gnome and budgie aficionados out there. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it, it they introduced actually a lot of new features also to budgie 10.5.1. Uh, mm -hmm. Introduced uh, hinting and anti-aliasing um, settings in the fonts section of the budgie desktop settings. And I noticed that, you know, it, it, immediately that 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 was always an issue because the when you'd uh, zoom in or if you had an ultra hd display they'd be fuzzy so this will go a long way to making those much the fonts much more crisp crisper and um as pedro was saying budgie 
uh, Budgie 10.5.1 provides support for several GNOME stack releases, including GNOME 3.30, 3.32, and 3.34. And this is actually really significant because this allows a greater number of users to get updates, which, which has been an issue. So that's been really good. And I really had fun uh, watching Joshua Strobel, the Solus project lead, fi fix bugs and integrate the latest GNOME updates in Solus Live on his Twitch channel. I watched that for probably about four or five hours and interacted with him in chat. It was it was really fascinating and really amazing, actually. <laughs> so that That's was really, really cool. good to see that mm -hmm. the Solus project is still able to just keep rolling on. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah. They're yeah. amazing. Okay. And, you know, as much as I can harp on some of the issues that have cropped up and the lack of certain uh, oh, packages. Yeah, that's, that's right. You got rid of Solus, right? You uninstalled it. Um, came very close to. Pedro needed then to they complain on the, the internet to somebody to vent his frustration. <laughs> he had no intention of actually getting rid of it because he loves it. I, I, I kind of do because, yeah, yeah, it's a Linux distro that isn't based on Ubuntu, it isn't based on Red Hat or Fedora or anything. It's not based on mm -hmm. anything. It was built from the ground up to be its own thing. And yes, the package selection is limited in the rep in the repos, but that allows a very small team to deliver a very, very nice operating system. Yes. I like it. <laughs> Glad yeah. it's working. We love Solus. Updates. <laughs> Flatpak. Uh, mm -hmm. Development is not standing still. No, it is not. Um, this is from going, what is it? Yeah, the GNOME blog. All this inner show notes. Yep. Go check that out after the fact. Um, just a lot of quality of life stuff. I mean, we're going to be seeing parental controls, disk space checks. Uh, they're going to implement a system for either purchasing or donating. That's really neat. Good. Yeah. And you're also going to get the ability to mass updates. So when something needs updating, it's like, hey, man, I'm just going to do that for you. So they'll stew a foo. Look that up, kids. I mean, don't. <laughs> um, just lots and lots of quality of life features planned for future. And I, I really like to see that. So because if... if if you held a loaded water gun to my head and said, pick one, and it's like, if I have to, I'm like, yes, you have to. And I'm going to pick Flatback. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite thing about uh, Flatbacks oh, no. is yeah. that, yeah, <laughs> uh, is that they don't, um, put this in the notes. <laughs> they're, uh, they don't create that little stupid lowercase folder <laughs> right in the middle of my home folder. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy about that. Yay. <laughs> you know, that little folder was the best 20 pound uh, dare I, I've ever had in my entire life. Like, hands down. <laughs> Doesn't even need to be there. <laughs> at this point, it's, at this point, it's principle. <laughs> at this point, I'm going to keep not using snaps. Oh, man. <laughs> Don't wait on snaps. <laughs> yeah, app images do the same as well. They're nice and self-contained. <laughs> Yes, so. <laughs> actually self-contained. Go figure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but what's it, this is cool and Flatpak development is now open. They're, you know, are looking for contributions from the community and would love to hear from you. So that's that's how a lot of this development has occurred is because of the users out there. So very important. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really neat. <laughs> Fedora 31, 32, man. I-686 is 86, man. Go look up the origin of that word. I found it up. Uh, it's a transitive verb, if you're wondering. Uh, <laughs> pretty interesting read, as I found out. But yeah. uh, we knew this was coming. And this is I'm, I'm going to tag that in a minute because I'm like, yeah, they finally did it for the thing. And I-386 support, it's going away. But what do you do if you're running 32-bit? Um, <laughs> on your computer but you know roughly until june of 2020 so that's going to be at the end of uh the four uh, fedora 30 life cycle and your upgrade path is going to be to buy a cpu made in the last decade and some change man i know that's the thing but this is for the better this is going to happen across all distributions except for get off my lawn os whenever that comes out <laughs> <laughs> But I'm going to say this because I've definitely seen on my Twitter um, or someone making the point of, you know, I think this is unfair. Fedora is dropping i386 support. 
where's the outrage that everyone had when Ubuntu announced that they were dropping a 386 port? Um, because you know, the internet went full metal, like OMG WTF BBQ on that. And I was like, mm -hmm. really? I was right there with you. I was with the wine team. I'm like, what? <laughs> Let me tell you why. One <laughs> word. Surprise! Because that's how Canonical <laughs> did it. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, we're talking about this again, and they're finally getting into it. That's really genuinely the only difference. I was like, yeah. so when are you implementing mm -hmm. this? next week i mean not really next week but the equivalent of <laughs> yeah the next version yeah. and with fedora at least they specifically said on the first announcement yes we're going to be uh dropping the i686 repos but you will still be able to get the multi-libs the 32-bit mm -hmm. libraries for 64-bit operating systems in the repo mm -hmm. the 64-bit repo we're just going to scrap the 32-bit repo and everything <laughs> that requires 32-bit multi-lib it's still going to have it it's good that you pointed yeah. that out because exactly. yeah, I'm thinking when I say that, yeah, multi arch is still going to be around. Yeah. yeah. And Ubuntu, the, the, their thing was no multi arch, no multi lib. They were going nothing. Yeah. They were just <laughs> completely <laughs> drop. And as yeah. I yeah. said on the show, I was like, I kind of respect that. Somebody's got to do it at some yeah. point. But, yeah. No. But yeah, Fedora is straight. They came out and straight up said, it's like, no, we're going to keep multi-lib. That's still going to be mm -hmm. a bit of functionality that we're going to maintain. Mm -hmm. So as long as I can play my fidget games, I'm yes. good. <laughs> my yes. PlayStation 5. Come on, man. Or Switch. <laughs> Switch is run Linux. At that point, I'd rather buy a Stadia. <laughs> How do you buy a Stadia? You mean the controller? You buy the controller with a little thingy. So coming up next, uh, something that I get to play with, and Jill, you get to play with. I think Pedro's even opened one at one point. It was on a Tuesday. Yeah. Um, video <laughs> editing. Yeah. So this is an article about the best free video editing software on Linux. And but uh, but it brings out some some very in 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 <laughs> one of the most important uh video editors out there under open source, uh, which of course is uh, Kden Live. And uh, um, only three of the eight ed video editors listed uh, work on Linux, OpenShot, DaVinci Resolve, and Shotcut. And I just, I can't believe that Kden Live was left out. <laughs> like what? <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually another article from a few months ago that has a really a great list of all the video editing software on Linux um, at its FOSS. And um, I also really love Flowblade, Flowblade, Cinelera, and the new Olive Video Editor. So those were uh, several of the video editors that did not make the cut in in this article. <laughs> FOSS bites. <laughs> Interesting. Yes, the floss <laughs> is just for show. Yeah. They kind of threw that out there. And I wanted to throw this in the um, notes because <laughs> the universal recommendation was open shot, which I would. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> however, to follow on that, Katie and Live is definitely not on the list. So I'm just going yeah. to personally declare that entire list invalid. Um, yes. I don't know if somebody had a word. <laughs> count they had to reach and they use that but i'm going to say that kd and live is the multi-purpose thing i mean you can use it on the yeah. windows um and it's definitely available on linux multiple versions and you can get it as an app image and it's easy enough to walk in and play with and you're like i need to edit my pedro video because we all have pedro videos and <laughs> you can do it I'm put sorry. it to youtube it's a piece <laughs> of cake then that's what you should use Open shots, man, I, I'm coming from somebody the first 130 weeks we did Linux Gamecast, I was using OpenShot and I was like, this thing works. Mm -hmm. It was simple. It was easy because I didn't need an advanced editor because I do all the stuff live to tape, all that yeah. bit. So I just needed to chop ins and tie stuff together. Worked great for that. Then version two happened. Then it didn't happen in years. <laughs> Maybe it's in a better spot at this point. It's just too far behind for me to... Uh, Recommended anyway. And really, we all should be running DaVinci Resolve because I'm DaVinci Resolve show. Hi, Black Magic, call me. Uh, <laughs> that That's definitely a pro level thing. Also, like Lightworks, I mean, if you don't yeah. like somebody, go ahead and put that on their box. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and go into it and don't tell them how to get out. <laughs> Not too bad. Aww. More on that in the feedback section, but uh, the, that, yeah. that's an interesting list, yeah. man, just to omit. Yeah. Like, bites. Now, I I'd know. heard of Foss Bites and their... Um, not so stellar reputation with the Linux community in general, but posting a list of free video editors <laughs> and not all of them being free software, despite having FOSS exactly. in the name. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that I, I can see why now. Now I can certainly see why, because <laughs> it's like the Apple, what was it? The um, Apple iMovie? Yeah. Really? Really? Yeah. <laughs> hey man, it works on a operating system. Yes, the one. <laughs> Tune in next week when Lex Incast only covers the latest Windows releases. Uh, darn. Uh, gotta talk about this. Gotta talk about this. Um, I'm going to talk oh about this. Mm, oh, boy. More in detail. Over on the uh, Ubuntu blog, over at Canonical, Alan. Alan wrote a thing, man. He's like, easy Linux game streaming on OBS. And it, it's short, and it's sweet, and it's technically... To a point, um, I would argue the point itself, but this walks through apparently doing this. I mean, this is a thousand yard overhead view to which I read through. I was like, oh, that's good. Somebody needs to make this. And then I read it. It's like, that's just going <laughs> to confuse people. And I, I, I say that as somebody who's on ROBS and the support channel <laughs> in OBS on their discord doing my best to watch out for the Linux folks trying to get more people using it. Don't stream on a laptop. Hey, <laughs> Hey, let's get started. If you must stream on a laptop, say you have one that is powerful enough to do this. Like w- would you stream on your um, Z on laptop, Pedro? Do you think uh, you could pull it, it off? Threads. Mm-hmm. With the NVIDIA Quadro, yeah. Yeah, if it was something really light, sure. Yeah. Really, mm-hmm. really light. We're talking like 2001 game, like Neverwinter Nights, which I actually did stream on a laptop. Mm-hmm. Go look that stream up. <laughs> 720p. <laughs> so we're talking about that. If you have a laptop, if you must, if you can do it, because I respect it. It's like, I don't have a billion dollars <laughs> to build something. Use what you have to a point. Some point, diminishing returns is going to kick in. If you stream it on a laptop... Don't use Wi-Fi. Don't believe me. Go, go put your log into the OBS logifier. Big warning right there at first. It's like t- problems. Wi-Fi, it's good for receiving. You're not good at broadcasting. Mm-hmm. Get an Ethernet dongle. Mm-hmm. They're cheap. USB. Um, if you're going to be on a laptop, plug it into the mains. So it's not in any type of power save mode, period. And the one thing I did see... I'm not picking on you, Alan, because it's good somebody did this at least. I was like, hey, here's some idea how to do this. Never use AMD or Intel based encoding. It's junk. It's Mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. This is not debatable unless you're like, hey, I'd like to use it for local recording because you have to feed it a redonkulous bit rate to even get like, yeah, I guess that doesn't look horrible. Don't do that. Uh, Use your CPU and go back to like probably why you shouldn't be doing this on a laptop. And when it comes to installing OBS, don't use a flat pack. Don't use an app image. Don't use a snap. Install it. If you're on Ubuntu, <laughs> there's a PPA for that from OBS. Stick with it because it works and I will be able to troubleshoot your problem. But maybe I want to install the Linux browser, Joe. <laughs> yeah, so that's an issue. Um, one of the major issues reported on the GitHub page was the OBS uh, Linux browser plugin is included with the snap, but seg faults when adding a Linux browser source. So <laughs> that's no good. <laughs> no, and, no, you know, it's not. That, that, that's like one of the major features a lot of the you know those that stream of us who stream on Linux use. <laughs> so, and I think if if uh, we tried to use it here at Linux Gamecast, Venn Studio would explode. <laughs> I don't think now. the Venn Studio would explode. I think Venn would explode. When it's ben like, no, would, no, just kill me now. The, just, just, yeah, no. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Because we, we need bare metal for all this stuff we're doing here. <laughs> so... Yeah. And, you know, the app image of OBS does actually run quite well, uh, but I wouldn't use it in production. 
And so I wouldn't be using the snap in production either, unless I was just streaming a, a game that doesn't, you know, that doesn't take up much memory. And that's all you need is one one screen. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. And, um, go, go on, go on. I, I, I was just going to say, I kind of gave up when uh, Popey is like, yeah, you should use the snap and mm -hmm. use um, hardware encoding for Intel via the FFmpeg VA API. It's like, ah. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> Unless you went through the trouble and it comes out of the box with quick sync enabled in Ubuntu, which I don't think it does, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, he uh, shows how to enable it, doesn't he? No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> it, it, nowhere oh. in the list does he show uh, the quick sync bits because mm -hmm. I went through that trouble of enabling quick sync on Linux. It requires a lot of accepting uh, Intel terms of service. So that's my reasoning as to why that, that mm, no. <laughs> hmm. it's probably doing some form of hardware acceleration on the Intel um, GPU, but it's not quick sync and quick sync. Mm -hmm. It gets the job done. It's still not going to be NVENC with a, a 20 series graphics card. Good, but it is better. I tried um, with, uh, mm. what was it? Uh, the 19, what's on Ubuntu? The previous version of Ubuntu before I went over to Fedora and then I went, ended up on Debian. The, the their FFmpeg that they shipped uh, didn't have NV and code support, but the Snap mm -hmm. did. And I was like, you know what? I, I don't like talking negative about anything, especially something that I haven't used. So I tried that and I was like, you know what? Maybe we can make this to be a good, you know, data point. We're like, hey, this is... I don't know, install plugins, question mark, got to have plugins, because <laughs> Linux browser doesn't ship. And I honestly never could. I tried, I found a way with a flat pack version of OBS to make that work, but it was crash-tastic and it hung on me like after I'd set up some scenes. I was like, okay, we're just going back. Debian, Debian Multimedia, enable that repo, mm -hmm. install OBS, FFmpeg's <laughs> already done with NV encode. I didn't have to build anything, but... Yep. Probably next week, I'll have a video about building OBS for the latest and greatest. So you too cool. can build your own little <laughs> containerized version. Uh, we'll, we'll call it a, I don't know, a Vin container. It's just a folder in your home directory <laughs> that has everything. So you just run it from there and then you can run OBS, whatever you have um, on your operating system. It's kind of brilliant. It's kind of fun. Uh, hardware encoding. Let's stay on that. Yes. And this mm -hmm. one comes from Foxy. Jill, yeah, what is Foxy so talking about? Oh. Yeah, oh. <laughs> it's Foxy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so this is awesome. Um, NVIDIA has joined the Blender Foundation Development Fund at the patron level. Yay! And now NVIDIA joins Epic Games at, at that uh, patron level. And that's 120K or more a year. That's amazing. That will allow for two more developers to work on core Blender development and keep the NVIDIA GPU rendering well supported and even faster in the future. And yes, thank you and Foxdog for finding that tweet. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. This is took them amazing. long enough. Yeah. Uh, I also like <laughs> to see the uh, the comments everyone's like uh where's the Vulcan? We want some yes. Vulcan bits. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> Give that's us the coming. Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> that's coming. They had a uh, Blender developers have been working on that. So <laughs> Yeah. I think it's interesting um I don't know if it's made into main yet, but they are definitely working with uh, support for tensor cores on mm -hmm. NVIDIA hardware yeah. for your ray tracing. To some extent, I mean, it, it, it's outside of my pay grade, but I'm like, hey, that's getting built in. And yes, yes, I know. You're like, that's proprietary, but it's still going to be supported, which is good. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't buy an Kuda RTX card for... Um, yeah. Well, the latest version finally works with the 20 series card. So I, I didn't get an NVIDIA card because it had tensor cores, man. I don't think anyone really did. But you can at least put them to use in a very, very yeah. fun, entertaining type way. Yes. And that is great news for Blender. We've been talking Yay. about great news for um, <laughs> Godot. I mean, it's great. Fantastic. Because doing mm -hmm. this stuff is expensive. Speaking of that, commercial time, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Nay, yes. not for a mattress. No, we're not trying to sell you a levitating soup bowl. We're trying to sell um, us. Uh, if you like what we do and you want to support it, you're like, hey, man, these yahoos are worth like four quarters a week. You can do that over at patreon.com forward slash letting scheme cast. We got Libra pay. We got a store with shirts in it. I know it's terrifying. PayPal, wish list, bitcoins, and 
a bunch of affiliate links. Mm -hmm. Thank each and every one of you for making this possible. Mm -hmm. It's a fun experiment we get to do. It'd be awesome uh, for all of our Patreons. If you like chatting with us during the week, you know, like, where are you guys at? They're at? We have a Discord set up just for you. We're in there. We're talking, usually talking smack, but it's a pretty chill place, except for the weird pictures of spaghetti Reese's pieces. And um, with beans. With beans. You say that like it's <laughs> not a horrible piece of nightmare imagery that'll be forever etched into your retinas and your gray matter. I'm like, no. You know what? On your deathbed, throw that up. Reese's Pieces, beans. Eh. <laughs> beans and tomato sauce, Reese's Pieces. <laughs> you, you can definitely do that. Uh, thanks, everybody. That helps us pay the bills. And, oh, man, fun stuff keeps us going. Yes, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. And Anja, mm -hmm. what a command. I don't know what you did, man. That's on you, Rohit. That's on you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's oh. get in to a slice of pie. Oh, yes. that's cool. Good picture, Ben. <laughs> so Raspberry Pi enthusiast George Godinez makes the first low-profile Raspberry Pi 4 cooler. It's, it's really neat looking. It has a direct touch heat pipe, which is encased in thermally conductive resin with the bottom exposed to make contact with the Raspberry Pi 4. And one of the, the, the uh, most significant things about this heat pipe is that this cooling option is low profile and will accommodate most Pi 4 hats, which is a big issue because a lot of the cooling options out there do not do not accommodate the the pie extra goodies on top the hats so that that was uh, very important and it's made of aluminum and it looks really cool actually a heat pipe for a raspberry pie the, that's actually a very good point jill that's something that i didn't think about at all because i saw it's like okay so how much does that cost that's 20 bucks Okay, uh, for a completely passive, mm -hmm. just the one heat pipe and the aluminum fins. It's like, um, that's almost the same mm -hmm. money that you would pay for that TD Tiny uh, tower Aww. cooler that we talked about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And at least that one has a fan. It does yes. some active cooling and it also has a heat pipe uh, going directly over the SOC. But yeah, that, that's a very good point, Jill. Uh, with that tower cooler, mm -hmm. hats are kind of a no-go. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I, I see the point. <laughs> I always like when I read direct contact heat pipes because I think I, I, my, I visualize indirect <laughs> contact and I'm like, oh, it's just sitting over here. It's near osmosis a cooling, but I know what they mean. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. That's kind of fun. And Pedro, you are correct. You'd have to put some type of, one would assume, then again, mm -hmm. it might be able to get away with passive. I mean, it's going to be cooler than nothing, period. Absolutely. Oh, yes. I mean, if uh, that teeny tiny fan on that tower cooler cuts the temperature in half, mm -hmm. uh, then I'm guessing this one, if, it may not be as good, but it's since the like contact area is bigger and it actually targets more of the, um, the components on the PCB, it might help with dissipation considerably. And if you have a case that mm -hmm. has a teeny tiny fan that goes on top of that, that will help even more. So... That what might if I work. put my hair dryer on it and hold down the cold button? Uh, you'll probably uh, melt it. The cold button? Oh, the cool button. No. no. It should be fine. Yeah, yeah man. A bit cool loud, button. but fine. It's got little sunglasses and leather coat. Weird, man. All right. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Microbiotis. But now what you're well, thinking. Well, uh, my microscopies or <laughs> microscopies or microscopy? Something like that. Oh, right. Someone God, put a raspberry pie on top of a microscope before I give myself uh, some kind of brain <laughs> condition of trying to spell me. that. Yeah. Uh, microscopy? Yeah, that could work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it is exactly uh, what it says. It is an old, um, mm -hmm. an old um, microscope that Martin Tettered uh, basically took the top apart and shoved the Raspberry Pi camera in there with a little adapter for the lenses, and the Raspberry Pi then becomes a digital um, output for the um, 
for the microscope itself. And you can see there's a video there and they go through like all the bits uh, in the software with what you can do. It's like, okay, that the, the software still needs a little bit of work because it's not a very well integrated looking experience. It just boots into the, the regular um, Raspbian desktop and then you have to start all the software by hand and it's not very uh, touch friendly. So yeah, it needs it needs a little bit of work on the um, on the software side, but I'd say the hardware, he nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. That's exactly the kind of prototype slash DIY mm -hmm. stuff that's useful and really neat that I kind of like to see. So yeah, good job there, Martin. Very very nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do kids do that? I remember getting a microscope as a child. So a digital microscope for the price of a raspberry pi and the uh, yeah. the camera yeah yeah <laughs> mm. i don't know what it see even adult me wouldn't that'd be my problem then then i'd like start breaking things because i'd be looking for things to put under it <laughs> <laughs> well chances are you not everyone has a uh, destructive mentality it's not destructive <laughs> it's science shut up <laughs> Science isn't about why, it's about why it's not. It's about why not. Cave Johnson. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, maybe you have, you're a mad scientist yourself and you want to get in touch with us. Tell us about projects that you're working on or something that you've seen and it's amazing. Or more likely than not, maybe we got something wrong. We did, apparently. Um, stay tuned for that. How do you do that carrier pigeon I've heard? You can totally uh, record mm -hmm. a video of yourself, put it in a flash drive, attach it to a carrier put it pigeon, in the pigeon, and wait, no, shoot it monster. away. <laughs> don't, don't put it in the pigeon. You kind of need it to fly afterwards. <laughs> that explains well, that weird it, it might be... package. <laughs> it, it might well, be yeah. faster than snail mail. <laughs> Borderline. Borderline. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, best way to do it is to go to linuxgamecast.com, you hit the contact button and fill out the form. Just make sure you pick LWDW from the show selection box and uh, fill out the rest of the form. It's very easy, very simple, very self-explanatory. You can even send some hate mail for that Saturday show, What We Do. Well, I went for car, and... car, car, but it's like car, car. That car? would work too, unfortunately. Car, car. A little darker. Car, 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 car. <laughs> Don't finish this sentence. <laughs> 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 but yeah it is um it's the best way to do it you can also uh leave us a comment on youtube uh i check on those regularly enough uh the he does, patreons he post them in the show notes i do <laughs> mostly because the ones from last week it's like okay none of these are really like questions that we didn't answer in the totally show got looking at you show notes this week from a youtube comment <laughs> <laughs> oh you got the one all right <laughs> but yeah do like uh these fine folks did and uh you'll get your uh bit of feedback featured right here Name right lights, now baby. yeah let's and go with phyllis Laura. man um <laughs> son Laura. phyllis is like yo check this out we can all say cinema mm -hmm. for a movie mm -hmm. as sign ma do the same <laughs> for sign ma or a <laughs> As sign Lyra. Okay. Stability is so important. No one wants to lose work for sign Lyra. Good. <laughs> provides <laughs> that. <laughs> yes. Steep learning curve, but there's help and getting started to it. Now, this, this was from a minute ago, but somebody got around to finally watching that. Yeah. What we were talking about. This is another. This is that nonlinear video editor that you can leave out of the open source list, and everybody's like, "Yeah, it's cool. Don't worry about it." Oh, <laughs> no, it works great now. Because <laughs> it is a just from the basic confusion of which one should I get? And it's like, yeah, you need to <laughs> research that. Yeah. Um, followed by a mid '90s, uh, an interface that makes a mid '90s like uh, program on IRIX. Uh, look very <laughs> user friendly and intuitive, man. Oh, you don't like that turquoise and, and orange? No, I'm talking about the usability and functionality of it. Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn a new interface and you uh, a new workflow, but at some point you're like, oh, I see why that's there, and I'm like, no, this is developer layout. I know this. I've done this. I'm guilty of this. This is just <laughs> the thing, though. <laughs> 
So, yes, I will try to do my best to enunciate, uh, how did I screw it up properly? Uh, sign Lyra <laughs> G. <laughs> Sinalera dash GG. Good game. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> and it's a great editor. It's really improved over the years, too. I think one of the <laughs> biggest issues with help and support, man, like, I, you know, I, I start, if I work on something, it's like, man, that took me more than like 20 minutes to figure out. I make a video about it. Do the same for this, people, if you're using it, because like the guides for this program are nine years old. Mm hmm. Yeah. D yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got one more. And I suppose mm -hmm. uh, Frostclaw. Uh, and he's Frosty. talking about, uh, yes, uh, the mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi Poo. Uh, hello. I just wanted to let you know that as an almost electrical engineer, I can for sure confirm that the Poe voltage Would regulator you hire that an they almost are using... electrical engineer? <laughs> If he did it on the cheap, depending on what I was doing. Pedro, yeah, exactly where I was, like, depending on the discount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, so you're learning, right? This is a learning experience, right? Uh, so what's the discount right. like? <laughs> Just but yeah, I could for sure mm -hmm. confirm that the Poe voltage regulator that they're using on that tutorial from last week is fairly cheap and low quality, and you can definitely burn the pie or your house down. Uh, I would recommend buying an official Poe hat for the Pi. Um, that's P-O-E. Now, I, it now clicked in my brain. Power over e um, Wow, that's halfway through. It's like power over Yes. E oh. <laughs> for the Pi from the Raspberry Pi <laughs> Foundation. This will avoid uh, the Schrodinger's cat dilemma of not knowing whether your house caught fire while you were at work. Love the show. Good luck with your boots. Thank you, Frostclaw. Mm. And uh, yes, Aww. the boots have arrived. I showed them on the show. <laughs> and, you know... Thanks, Frosty, for letting we call him Frosty. He's been one of our we? patrons, and <laughs> I call him Frosty. There we he's, go. he's a friend. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> but Frostka, th thanks for letting us know. And you know, uh, speaking of which, Frosty has an awesome Raspberry Pi and 3D printing YouTube channel, um, and makes really good videos. So you know, he he actually knows this from experience. <laughs> so he's been doing this. And a long I can time. see that because POE <laughs> yeah. can deliver what. 50 watts, mm -hmm. 45 watts. Yeah. So yeah, you could do some damage. <laughs> See, what I'm going to do is include a link because I love you, Frosty. Jill's like, ah, you can go find it yourself. I'm going to put a link in there so yeah, people can yeah. find your YouTube channel. Yes, we will. <laughs> yes. <laughs> get on it, Jill. Yeah. Okay, this we'll do. Stuff, man, I'm going to get on to you. Uh, <laughs> Beautiful people. We get a bounce out of here. Uh, it's been awesome. Thanks for joining us live or after the fact if you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us on the MP3s of the podcast because we're effectively everywhere we can be. That's kind of brilliant. But we'll see you next week. Until then, let's... Uh, mm -hmm. you know. there, there it is. Oh, there we credits. go. <laughs> <laughs> Stone. Yeah, no, I blame the font. <laughs> the <what>? Pedro Mateus <laughs> and the Jill Bryant. Oh. Uh, uh, no, I blame the font on the uh, on Bradley because it doesn't do capitals. They're all the same size. So. It only does capitals. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it has advanced capital technology. Technology. So, yeah, Poe. It, it didn't register in my brain. It's like, oh, Poe. No, it was Poe. Uh, yeah, oh. <laughs> it was oh, okay. all the way. So what nineties <laughs> band was that? Nineties. Hmm. <laughs> I can come up with a lot of eighties bands, but not nineties at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, well, uh, that's really good because Frosty is, is helping us uh, do the safety dance on that one. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>